The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. This meeting of the Sharp Board of Aldermen will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to be followed by a brief moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Each of you has before you a copy of the modified agenda. Are there any proposed revisions to the agendas written? Yes, I have one. Okay. Um. Get the right agenda out. Um, under board business, item 10, that's page 3. Item 10G. I'd like to add the consideration of issuing a building permit for property located at 976 Mississippi Highway 12 East. <coughs> yeah, adding item L. Wait, no item G. There's an F on here. Does everybody have an F on your agenda? Mm -hmm. The F. revised agenda has an F. Consideration of revising the position of the receptionist clerk to that of the general office clerk at telephone switchboard as primary duty. That right. should be item 10F. Right, that's 10F. So okay. this revision would be item uh, 10G. And the proposed revision is adding an item 10G that would read, consideration of issuing a building permit on property located at 976 Highway 12 East. Is that the proposed that is correct. revision? Is there any objection to that proposed revision? Any objection? Any objection? Seeing none, please note the change in your package. Any further proposed revision? Any further proposed revisions? Any further revisions? Any further revisions? Seeing none, the motion to approve the agenda is written. Is in order? So moved. Motion's been made by Alderman Corey to approve the agenda. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been seconded by Alderman Carver. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure for the passes. Uh, you have now the. Uh, Consent agenda uh, written as well. Is there any objection to the consent agenda as written? Any objection? Any objection? Any objection? Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved. All right. Uh, first matter before you is the approval of the November 3rd, 2009 minutes. So moved. Motion's been made by Alderman Dumas to approve the minutes of November 3rd, 2009, regular meeting of the City of Stark for Board of Aldermen. Is that your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Corey. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. As your passes. Next matter before you is the consideration of the approval of the December 1st, 2009 minutes. So moved. Motion's been made by Alderman Corey to approve the minutes of December 1st, 2009 regular meeting of the City of Stark for Board of Aldermen. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Sisterock. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure for the pass. All right. We'll now move into comments by the mayor and board. And uh, the comments I have tonight are just related to the census. Uh, the community is gearing up for the 2010 census. 
very important uh, time and um, in honor of uh, March starting uh, the uh, official campaign and promotion uh, period of the census. All of you have a uh, mug on your desk, uh, compliments of the U.S. Census Bureau. Please in enjoy and uh, feel free to display prominently for the camera so that people viewing the meeting at home can see it tomorrow night. Yeah. And uh, one other announcement on the census, uh, one of the members of the uh, Complete Count Committee, Ms. Chevelle Rice, is putting together a fashion show to help promote the census and provide uh, community event as well. That's going to be on March 19th at 7 o'clock. And Ms. Rice has asked that uh, any member of the board who is interested uh, to be a judge at the fashion show on, on March 19th. So what I'll do is we'll follow up with an email. Uh, Ms. Sistrunk is going to be the MC, and I, I'm going to provide a welcome. So I guess we're out as judges, yeah, but uh, everybody else is interested in being a judge, uh, please respond uh, to the email and, and let us know one way or another. I think you're all the most qualified judges. <laughs> no, we, we can't be judges, and, and there needs to be uh, some judges. So y'all, I, I, I encourage you to do it. That's all I have. Comments by the board. Are there any comments from the board? Any comments? Any comments? Seeing none, we'll move to citizen comments. Any citizen wishing to speak may be recognized for a maximum of three minutes. Please uh, step to the podium and introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Further citizen comments? Thank you to the new board. My name is Charles Hendricks. I'm a resident of 625 Hendricks Road. And the reason why I'm here tonight is to get a follow-up on some paperwork that we have tried to get roads taken over by the city. And really, needs to try to find out what's the hold up or what do we need to do. What kind of paperwork do we need to submit to the city and allow for the city to uh, be able to take over the road itself. We do benefits probably about 10 years to see that kind of process. So that's my request to try to find out something. Alden Perk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let me just briefly uh, respond to Mr. Hendricks' um, inquiry, and I ask him to see Ms. Lynn Sproul, our Chief Administrator, also uh, after uh, the meeting, or sometimes she's available. But Mr. Hendricks, uh, this is what happened. Um, Hendricks Road for the boys in Ward 6 is out uh, North Starkville near the, uh, the landfill. And what happened when we annex your area into the city on about October, November of 19, uh, 98, uh, Hendricks Road was not a road that was a county approved road. So any road that was not a county approved road, this board treated said road as a private road. Uh, thereafter, uh, this board entered an order on its minutes through official action <coughs> indicating that uh, Jesse, Fannydale, 
Geechee, Kaya, Hendricks, and Treasure Lane can become an official city road provided that the residents on either or any of those roads in question deed uh, the area in question for a road width over to the city and that road width would be a width that would be determined by our uh, engineer. And once that was done in the form of a warranty deed uh, that would give the city a fee simple or clear title and the city would accept that deed and then we would treat that road as a public road and will be maintained. The only road that has met that criteria in the area in question is uh, Geechee Road, and that's where the landowners uh, conveyed the, uh, the width and the area in question over to the city. The city accepted that, and then the city went and maintained it. Now, I know you, you and others had, made, had employed uh, an attorney at some point, but it's my understanding that the city was given a uh, legal instrument that did not meet the legal requirements of the board action. What the, the city need based on that prior order of the board is we just need a warranty deed that conveys the area in question per the uh, recommendation of the city engineer and once we get that and that's all we need then uh, we will accept that and then we will maintain it so uh, that's why we cannot go in and do it and work and of course and I've been talking with you and other uh, residents about that's what needs to be done on, on, on all the roads, not just yours, but the rest of it. Geechee is the only one that's been done. So if you, uh, if you would just uh, talk with Ms. Spruill, and I inform her that uh, that you would like to meet with her, and, and she can give you the, the directions of where uh, you and other residents at that location need to go, and, and just have a seat. And, she'll, and I've identified her to you, and she knows that you want to talk with her, and she didn't have time tonight, she'll set you up for an appointment. But I'm, I'm very supportive of your request, but again, the law does not permit the city to do any work of any kind whatsoever on any private road, but once that is given to the city, then you know we'll be more than happy to do that. So that's our uh, dilemma. This is a, it's a legal uh, matter that impedes us from just going out there doing that. Now, so Ms. Brewer will get with you, or at some point during the meeting, and she'll set up a, a point or whatever time that may be, and, and she will give you the directions as to uh, where you all need to go from here. Okay? okay. And thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Thank you. And I, I know you're frustrated about the situation. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it makes it any better, but uh, we are frustrated by the situation too, uh, because until uh, the, the road can actually be needed to the city, uh, by law, we can't do anything with it. And I guess that it's going to require a two-part process. The first, uh, an engineer or qualified surveyor is going to have to go out and actually survey the property so that the lawyer can take that and, and, and put the uh, description of the property in a deed. And once it's deeded to the city, then it's city property and can be maintained by the city, and we can do something about it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I've got a question. Uh, first car. time I've heard about one of these. In that, in that situation, would each resident on the road be required to want to cooperate and deed the, the road over to the city, or is it a majority of the residents, or how does that work? Well, the city attorney may want to speak uh, some on this, but... Uh, Mr. Mr. Yes. May, may, may I respond? Sure. Okay. Mr. Uh, uh, Carver, what, what, what the board has said previously, all of the... Um, the property owners of the area in question would have to deed it. I mean, they don't have to um, agree. There's no legal requirement that they have to agree. In other words, if the engineer uh, indicates that a certain width uh, has to be what we need to have the roadway, then the property owners of that area would have to sign the deed. In other words, it's just like if you own property and before uh, I could get clear title to it. Whoever owns it with you, if anyone, would have to deed that over to me. So, but yeah, in this instance, all of the the persons who own the area in question. See, what happens is the city engineer will identify the area that we need, and if there's no legal description, the surveyor will go out and survey it, and that legal description is given to their lawyer, and then the lawyer will do a title search and um, and prepare the deed and, and, and if it's fee simple title, in other words, there's no lien or encumbrance or it's not tied up as collateral, 
then once that deed is given, for example, let's say real quickly in the interest of time here, let's say like Geechee Road, there are about three property owners out there. The city engineer went out there and identified what area of the roadway in question we need. So, there was, so the property owners in question uh, had a survey done and they took it to their lawyer, the lawyer that they hired at their own expense, not the city's expense. So they took it to their lawyer, their lawyer did a title search, did a title opinion, brought it and gave it to our attorney and then the board accepted that deed a warranty, the warranting title, and once we did that, we went out there and maintained the um, uh, the, the roadway, but the, but the prop owners are not under no legal obligation that they got to do it, you know, only if they want to. Okay. Further discussion? Are there any further citizen comments? It's sure. And Stan Sheridan, Recycling. <coughs> As you know, for the past five years, we contracted with the city to pick up the rubbish out throughout the city. And our contract comes up for automatic renewal May the 30th. And I want to just thank you for allowing us to renew this contract with you. Um, we've been working with Ms. Sherry Boyd and Calvin Ware for the past five years. We've got a good working relationship, and I think we've been keeping all the citizens satisfied with their needs to be met. I do understand there's some added extras you'd like to have done to the contract as far as like picking up unconforming waste or, or larger amounts of material that type of stuff and we'll be glad to work with you in any, any way to make this work out for the board and see satisfied with it. Thank you Mr. Mr. Sherry. Max, Mr. Sherry. Alderman Burke. Um, Mr. Sherry, let me, let me ask you one question. I just want you to refresh my memory on something. On that contract uh, that expired on May the 30th of uh, this year, you know, the original contract had July 1. Yeah. Could you refresh my recollection on how that change was made? You know, so there was a line drawn through the contract of July 1, and, and it was marked through and put May 31st, and, and one of the former uh, mayors uh, initialed that contract. Do you remember what uh, led about and brought about that change in that contract? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, once we bid the contract to start with July 1st, the contractor you had hired at that time pulled off the job, and, and we were asked to start the contract at, at that date. It's written on the side of the contract. Is your recollection that the board approved that, or did, uh, did, did the chief, of, the mayor, did that, or do you remember what happened? I, I don't remember. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Further discussion? Any further citizen comments? Any further citizen comments? Are there any further citizen comments? All right, seeing none, we'll move to public appearances. And our first public appearance this evening is Ms. Candy Creasink from the Starkville Area Arts Council. And all public appearances uh, have a maximum of 10 minutes. Uh, floor is yours. Hello, Mr. Mayor and the Board of Aldermen. I'm Chef Templeton, president of the Starkville Area Arts Council this year, and this is Maggie Bjorgum, who is the chair of the Cotton District Arts Festival uh, once again this year. And we're here tonight. You, you should have a copy of our request there for April 17th for a permit for the uh, Cotton District Arts Festival this year. Candy Creasink, our executive assistant, just passed out uh, to each of you a lovely magazine that the uh, partnership uh, did this year and it showed the Cotton District Arts Festival as the number one activity in Starkville. So we're proud to relay that to you. And our posters that we have, which are collector's items, they just came in today and we would present that to the city so you can get an idea of what this year's poster looks like. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll hit you with a few highlights of uh, the economic impact of the Cot District Arts <clears throat> Festival, and then I'll turn it over to Maggie to fill in some of the details. It's estimated that the impact of the Cotton District Arts Festival on April 17th will generate about $2.3 million for our community, with an estimated sales tax revenue of $108,000. <coughs> so we had approximately 28,000 people to attend last year's festival, which was a record crowd. And we anticipate that becoming at least that amount, if not more, this year. So, as you can tell, it's a great economic boost and makes for our community 
enrichment by enjoying the arts and all the activities that come with it. So, um, and by the way, our competition for the poster was uh, a new citizen of our community, Jude Landry, moved here from Illinois and participated in the community by winning the competition for that poster. So, anyway, those are the highlights of some of the economic impact that the Arts Festival has. And as you know, the Arts Festival provides many other activities throughout the year that also provide economic impact. A couple weeks ago, we assisted with the annual Magnolia Film Festival, which brought people in from around the country to Starville. This coming weekend, we're going to have a two-day event, the Everything Garden Expo. And, but our signature event is always the Cotton District Arts Festival. So now I'd like to turn over our remaining time to, to Maggie. Um. I'm really excited about this year's uh, festival. We're on target for a really uh, great event. Um, one of the new events that we have this year is the uh, is called Art Outdoors. It is to promote local artists. Um, and this year we are um, three weeks prior to the festival. Um, we will be doing a series of art classes at Not to Be Refuge, uh, and then uh, one of those classes will include. Um, uh, the, our 2010 juror this year um, for our artwork, um, and he, his name is Sammy Britt. Um, he's an art professor uh, as well as an artist. Uh, and then the work that comes out of that, uh, those series of uh, classes will be uh, exhibited Friday night at an artist <laughs> reception as well as on Saturday, uh, the day of the event. Um, we, as you will see in our uh, our request uh, for the permit that we are also requesting an extension on either end of University Drive because our festival is expanding um, due to its popularity. Uh, we have, uh, at least by now, we have about 100 artisans and 30 to 45 are um, first time artisans for this event. So we're really excited about that. Um, we also have four stages this year of local um, musicians as well as um, uh, musicians that are uh, around the southeast, Birmingham, Memphis, <coughs> Jackson, um, and the surrounding area. So we're really excited about that. And we're also requesting our normal services for the event from the city. That's our presentation. If you have questions, we would be happy to Any try to answer or them comments? and so forth. We appreciate your cooperation in the past. Any questions or comments by the members of the board? May have missed uh, Mr. Templeton. Who is the headline act this year? There's not a headline act. Okay. It's it's uh, we don't have a, one specific event. Do you? I was just this will be in conjunction with the Super Bulldog Weekend, right? Right, right. We have various you know local bands and groups that come from the area, and they we have each stage has an event going on at the same time. Okay. So they're four different bands playing at the same time all throughout the day's event, but there's okay. not one band or someone that we're promoting. Okay. We're promoting ourselves, it, we the community, and to enjoy the art through whatever form that there is that day. Okay, thank you. Okay. Further questions or comments by the members of the board? Any further questions or comments? Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight, and, and thank you for what you're doing. This this thank event has become a true treasure in our community, and I, I can't wait to attend. Okay, thank you so much. All right, our next public appearance is by Ron Kosman, uh, and Mr. Kosman is from the Healthy Hometown Committee. Good evening. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm Ron Cosman, and I'm speaking to you tonight in my capacity as a member of the healthiest, Starkville Healthiest Hometown Committee. And I want to recognize the chairman uh, of the committee, Dr. Lou Southward, who's back here. Uh, we also have two committee members over here, Dr. Uh, Ginger Cross with the Social Science Research Center, and then also Kelly White with OCH, and also a committee member with me on the uh, Bicycle Helmet Ordinance Committee. So, um, I wanted to speak to the proposed Child Safety Helmet Ordinance, which is in your packet. It's about 100 page 130 or so in there. 
Um, this is one of two ordinances that is suggested as part of the healthiest hometown competition that we are competing for and that is being sponsored by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The other ordinance being the smoking ban, we've already taken care of that. Now, obviously, the, the fundamental intent of any helmet ordinance is safety. Um, wearing a bicycle helmet reduces the, bre the risk of brain injury by anywhere between 74 and 85 percent, according to published reports. But one of the, I think, just as important reasons for a helmet ordinance like this is consistency. And that is, as a community, what we have done is we have now spent a lot of time and effort striping bike lanes, uh, submitting grants for multi-use paths such as the Lynn Lane multi-use uh, path project. We have a very active Safe Routes to Schools program, which promotes and encourages fourth through eighth graders to ride their bike or walk to school on a daily basis. So on the one hand, what we're doing is we're trying to encourage our citizens, and especially our children, to get out and ride bikes as a means of transportation, as a means of recreation, as a means of health. So I think that to be consistent as a community, what we want to do is we also want to create as safe an environment as we possibly can. And certainly a bicycle helmet ordinance or a safety helmet ordinance is one of those, to, to use a terrible pun, a no-brainer. We should be passing something like that. And it would also make us the first, to my knowledge, the first municipality in the state of Mississippi to pass such an ordinance. Uh, the language that you have before you came from a recently enacted ordinance, uh, I believe 2008, from the city of Vancouver, Washington. It is directed at all of those who are under 16. Uh, it addresses the certification of the helmet so that you know that it's going, to, that it's passed certain uh, safety regulations. And we've included just about every possible mode of transportation. There's also a six month window between enactment and enforcement. And that is, the reason for that is to give families time to learn about the ordinance, to gain a helmet, um, and possibly for us to even provide helmets to them. And we also want to try to do a education and awareness campaign, not only for the children who would be riding bikes, but also for the drivers who would be hopefully sharing the road with them. Now I have two data points to work with uh, as far as why or how this is needed in the city of Starkville. In October of 2006, we did a survey as part of our Safe Routes to Schools uh, grant application. And we found that 98% of children in grades 4 through 8 ride, um, ride the bus or carpool to school. So out of 1,509 children that we surveyed, 9 rode their bike which is an awfully small number to begin with. And of that, only one confessed to riding with a helmet. So I think we have our work cut out for us. Now, keep in mind that those fourth through eighth graders, 6% live within a half mile, a quarter live within a mile, and almost 50% live within two miles of the school that they were attending that year. So it's certainly conceivable, at least from a physical distance issue for them to ride or walk to their to their school. The other data point that I wanted to mention was we did a survey, Patrick Nordine, as a matter of fact, did that survey, uh, of University Drive in October of 2007. And they counted during the day 491 cyclists. 9.6% were riding the wrong way. 1.6 were riding, 1.6% were riding on the sidewalk, 1% were using their cell phones, and only 4.5% were wearing a helmet. These were predominantly college students, as you might guess. So again, those two data points suggest that we have room for improvement. <coughs> now, one concern that we have quite honestly, and, and speaking personally, I am not a huge proponent of regulation as a way to get people to change their habits, but that seems to be this is, this is one of the ways that we need to go. The concern was if you impose something like this, then you're requiring all families who have children to purchase helmets if they don't already have them. 
So to address that, we looked at uh, trying to find either reduced cost or free helmets that we could give away via the school systems. Uh, given that 30.6% of children in Starkville and Octibaha County live in poverty, and another 66% qualify for free or reduced lunch in the public school system, I calculated that we would need approximately 2,000 helmets to cover 60% of that population from pre-K through seventh grade. So that's what we're shooting for. We've been in contact with the Director of Injury Prevention with the Mississippi Department of Health, the Executive Director of the Brain Injury Association of Mississippi, the Mississippi Department of Rehabilitative Services, Centers for Disease Control, and the Pilot Clubs of Mississippi. And so we are following those leads. We have nothing concrete yet, but we're trying to get those 2,000 free or reduced helmets. Uh, I also submitted a grant to a private foundation in Jackson last week, and unfortunately found out today that it was not funded, so we won't have that funding. But we continue to explore ways to get free or reduced helmets into the hands of those who need them in, in Starkville. The other thing I want to mention <coughs> is we also plan to do an education and awareness campaign. And again, we're seeking funding for that. And that purpose of that would be to educate children about safe <coughs> cycling habits, to, get, to remind them to wear their helmets, to educate their, their parents that they need to follow this ordinance and the fact that it's for the child's own good. And then also for motorists on how to share the road and be on the lookout for, for kids on bikes. That's something that you don't normally have to deal with very much in this town. And I'm hoping that that's going to change. But along with that, some of the, ha some of the driving habits needs, need to change. And as part of that education and awareness campaign, we also want to build in a component of evaluation to do a survey prior to implementation of the ordinance and then one, say, six months or a year later to see exactly how many children are following the ordinance so that we have an idea how well we're doing. So that, in short, is, is the <coughs> ordinance, uh, the rationale for why we need one and sort of the uh, evidence that we have so, so far. Any questions? And I'll, I'll lead it off. Uh, okay. Worst case scenario, you you found uh, a, a, a a vendor of helmets, a way to a supplier of helmets uh, that, that 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 could supply them for as low as around four dollars a, a helmet. Between four fifty and five fifty per helmet. Okay. Questions, comments by the board. I have questions. All in the court. Uh, Ron, I know that others. <coughs> cities in the country have enacted similar ordinances. Are you aware of any in Mississippi that have? Or? No. No. And, and I've made some calls and no one else is aware of any in Mississippi either. So we would be the first municipality. And this may be a, a good time for <coughs> me and Alderman Vaughn to brief everybody generally on what we've been doing with the Healthy Hometown Committee. Uh, y'all will recall y'all sent us as the uh, city uh, government representatives uh, back in it was October, October, November, somewhere around there. Uh, th this is a fantastic group. Uh, it's uh, doing some great things. The application has to be submitted by April 16th. Uh, so they're busy working on that product. This is one of the things that's identified uh, as a, a pretty strong recommendation uh, that, that, that you have this as part of your application going forward. So it's an, an, an important uh, component of that. Uh, but there's a lot of other exciting things that are happening along with the application and exciting development uh, that uh, everybody should be aware of. I don't know if you all got the email. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, a very credible organization, uh, recently ranked every county in, in the United States and, and ranked counties within states in terms of their overall healthiness. Octibaw County of all 82 counties in Mississippi ranks number five in, in terms of the overall uh, health of this community. So that's a that's a wonderful stat for us. Alderman Vaughn, you have anything to add? I don't get chance to attend meetings like I should, but I think it's great for our children with the direction that the city is moving in. I think we're moving in the right direction because safety, safety is where I came from. Safety is number one. It's just safe to promote good health. And, and I think that it's something that we should really consider as a board to really pass this ordinance. 
Any more questions or comments? Further questions or comments? Further questions or comments? Alderman Carr. Uh, I'm just going to be completely honest about how I feel about this, and I didn't know. I know we've talked about this already today, but um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to say I am on the health committee with the statewide health committee, MML, assisting a, a, a man named John Sewell, who is the director of the, you know, choosing the healthiest hometown. And I've got issues with this. I'd like to see this table. And I know we're on a time constraint with as far as getting the application in. You said April the 16th. Mm -hmm. But um, the funding, you know, I'd hate to pass on the cost of uh, ticket violations. I guess it's a first time $15 violation to the families. I don't think that's an extravagant <coughs> amount to pay. However, if somebody's 10 or 12 year old kid walks in with a $15 ticket, you know, I've just got issues with that. I think that the cops got better, better things to do with their time. I'd hate to see them, um, you know, going after a 10 year old a kid riding around in a residential area. One of the things, well, the two major things I've got, I'd like to see maybe residential areas excluded from that. I don't think there's in my neighborhood that I know of any, you know, I think if a child does get out on highway uh, or let's say Whitfield, Louisville, and they're riding, there are going to be issues of needing to wear a helmet. If they're riding around in a residential area, I probably don't see it that being that big of a threat or a concern. Uh, <coughs> and then I guess secondly would be the funding issue, the funding mechanism, what we're talking about. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't like to see the city, I don't think the city should choose its funds to go and purchase 2,000? 2,000 helmets. Uh, Surely there's got to be some kind of grants we can pursue, you know, with that and and um, <clears throat> something we could do. But anyway, I'd like to see that table. I don't, maybe not for more than a meeting, if possible. And if that's not possible, we'll just have to vote on it tonight. But I think it's a good idea, but I think there's some more things to tweak and some issues we need to look at on that. So. And what we'd be doing tonight is just calling for the first public hearing. Uh, so what that okay. does is that gives us the opportunity, as we've done uh, with, with other ordinances, where everybody will get a bite at it to express their concerns <laughs> like that. And we can, it, it can be tweaked <coughs> now, between now and, and the final passage of it. it. Mr. Mayor, is that going to give us enough time for the application on the? It's exactly the... perfect. If we, if we want the ability to, to say we have it as part of the application, uh, it, it needs to proceed on that timeline. Okay. Mr. Mayor, um, by the way, by the way, Bob, Brother Coleman, we have a meeting Thursday, so some of you think she can come. I'm still Ron her to that weekend. We can it's South, what we can. Okay. Can, can I respond? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we do, we, we already have built in a six month window from the time that the ordinance is enacted to the time when it would be enforced and hopefully that would be a sufficient time for families to learn about this requirement and, and take measures to get helmets uh, frankly probably 90 95 percent of all bicycle use by kids is going to be in residential areas and that's where they're going to fall on the pavement I'm, I'm not as concerned about the enforcement aspect as I am about preventing Injuries. That's what this ordinance is all about. And unfortunately, I, I can understand why why you would want to exclude residential areas, but that's where kids are going to be riding bikes, and that's where they're going to be falling off of their bikes. Um, this, we are not calling for any city dollars to be spent for the helmets. We are pursuing either through foundations or other state agencies means to either get reduced price or free helmets. But as it stands right now, we can direct citizens to a host of websites where they can buy helmets for between four dollar four and a half dollars and five and a half dollars. Um, which is in reach within reach for most families in this community. So I just wanted to address those points. Thank you. Further questions, comments? I guess I have one last one before we leave. The, the way that um, <coughs> penalty is structured is uh, if somebody is cited, uh, they have the option of either paying a $15 fine or purchasing a help. Uh, so you actually could just remedy the situation and would never have to worry about a, a, a fine associated with it. That, that was one of the things we kind of kicked around because we, we didn't want this ordinance to be punitive in nature. Uh, and, and that was the best way of getting at the policy. And, and whose responsibility is it for, I mean, is it the police? Is, the, is it our code enforcement? I mean, is this a... Is It'd this be a, either of the above. Uh, they, they, <clears throat> both uh, units would have uh, 
the authority to write a citation. Because because I, I I too I mean we, we regulate a lot of things, but this is one thing I don't know that you know I, I know uh, this is kind of a separate issue, but <coughs> gen, the junior auxiliary of Starkville they do an event every year called Safety Town, and last year they actually gave uh, it, it's either for one or two classes, first or second grade, and every every student that's in school that day comes to the last year it was at the Armory, mm -hmm. and they uh, they come and it's just a safety and awareness workshop, and every kid that attended from like Tupelo County last year got a free helmet, and I think they got that from the Brain Institute, the Mississippi Brain Institute, Injury Institute, or something to that effect, but. Uh, there are sources out there for for free helmets. Yeah, we're, and we'll, we're actively and aggressively pursuing all those right now, because I would the sooner that I can have something in place in terms of a commitment, the better I'll feel just in terms of, of trying to sell this idea. I mean, and I'm, I mean, I totally believe in my kids wear helmets when they ride bikes, and, and I'm I'm a firm believer in that. I just don't know that I'm comfortable with the government regulating. Because it's not only bicycles, it's bicycles, the ordinance is bicycles, <coughs> scooters, uh, scooters um, skateboards, inline right. skates, roller, roller skates. I mean, it's a, it's a whole multitude of things and just a lot of things. To well, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeking funding for an education and awareness campaign is I would like more carrots, you know, as opposed to just a big stick. Uh, I, I'd like some incentives. You know that that we could use to actually encourage kids to follow this ordinance. And again, not I'm not coming to the city requesting that funding at all. I'm, I'm seeking other sources of funding for that. Yeah. Alden Perkins, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you very much for the recognition. I was, was going to wait until we got to the board business to make these comments, but uh, seemed like this may be a relevant time. Let me thank Mr. Cosman for uh, your time. Uh, of coming before this board with a matter that I deem to be very important. Let me additionally thank the mayor and to the gentleman from Ward 7 for their meticulous time in coming before the board with this very important matter. Uh, personally and objectively, I think that this is a good uh, enforcement of our police <coughs> powers in the city of Starkville. Uh, by police powers, this is a, a very prudent a mechanism to promote health, safety, and welfare. Anytime you're going to promote health, safety, and welfare in any place, area, territory, municipality, or county, it is a win win situation. It's just like the seatbelt law in Mississippi. You know, there was reluctance of passing of the seatbelt, but it's all about safety, welfare. Uh, that's what this is all about. Uh, there is no governmental regulation here that would be intrusive, in my opinion. Uh, there is no cost that is going to be assessed against uh, this municipality. Um, I think that this is something that uh, we need to move forward with. Uh, it's not unusual for this uh, city uh, to enact ordinance after ordinance. You know, we have all kinds of ordinances. We have ordinances that regulate the dogs and the animals, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion and, and the ordinances just, just go on and on and on. And like the mayor said, that this is just uh, coming up on the agenda just for a first public hearing. And uh, I know uh, the gentleman from Ward 4, you know, had a good question. Is this the first, uh, uh, is there any municipality in Mississippi that um, has enacted this? And the response was no, but let's look back during this 0509 administration. There was no other municipality in Mississippi that had uh, enacted a no smoking ordinance. So what has happened in Mississippi now? You know, everybody wants to have this no smoking ordinance. There's a lot of resistance. Well, if we enact this uh, no smoking, we're going to lose business. It's too much regulation. you getting involved in our freedom of the choice. But this has been a win-win situation. Uh, we uh, have not seen um, in a problem with the enactment of it. Uh, other municipalities throughout Mississippi have been looking at Starkville, other places, uh, progressive towns, progressive cities, the, the, uh, the dog park ordinance. You know, we took the lead in that. You know, that shows that we're about leadership. That shows that we're about 
uh, progress. We want to do the right thing. We want to attract people to our community. We're about safe. Anytime that we can save a life, you know, we just lost nine lives back on the 28th day of, of uh, December of 2009 in a house fire. You know, not to say that we could have done anything to prevent that at this table, but if, if we can use our foresight to, uh, to enact measures that can potentially save life. You know, kids that are under 16, you know, they don't think like adults. They just get out there and just ride. You know, they don't pay attention, but that's the thought process of a youth. So certainly if they put that helmet on, and uh, that will help preserve life. And, and, and that is um, good leadership for us. And I think that, you know, we need to, at the proper time on this agenda, let's have the public hearing. Just like other issues, uh, we had public hearing for alcohol and uh, and beer. We had people come in, and speak for it, and, and got passed, and we moved on. And and so with this, let's have a public hearing. The mayor, the mayor says on a very appropriate timeline. This is a win-win situation. I'm just saying this objectively, uh, looking at the totality of the facts and circumstances. I think this is good for our city. It's good for the children, and uh, let let's vote uh, affirmatively for the public hearing, then let's hear from the people in the community on the uh, first public hearing, the second one, and, and if we hear those comments, then we can go ahead and move forward, And but let's let the bottom line be what's best for our community. I think that this is the right thing to do, and, and again, I want to applaud all of you for all of your meticulous efforts and your um, motivation and looking out ahead for our future, because you know that our children uh, or our future. So again, with that, Mr. Mayor, I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any further questions, comments by the <coughs> member of the board? One last question uh, on the verbiage. It says a warning citation may be written by any authorized agent. Who would y'all have in mind besides the police department? It'd be code enforcement and police. And just police and code. Do we need to write, put that in there in the verbiage? I mean, just to have... You, you could spell it out, but uh, those are the only people that are authorized. Okay. <clears throat> further discussion? Any further discussion? <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. The next public appearance is by Diane Holloway. Diane Holloway. I'm the new chairman of Octibaha County's Relay for Life, and this is Barbara Foster, my Hi. co. And all we want to do is put out signs for eight weeks. <laughs> That's all we're asking for. And inviting you to come to our relay, please. At the Sportsplex May 7th, we are having the biggest birthday party that we believe anybody's ever attended. So that's all we're asking. That our teams can put their signs out and be acknowledged. Okay, and uh, before we move into questions and comments on it, uh, I've, I've had a conversation with the city attorney about it, and uh, I'll let him weigh in after I'm finished. Uh, my, my concern with this one is uh, that those signs aren't permissible under the sign ordinance, and there's no opt-out procedure that's written into the sign ordinance. Uh, and, of course, the... The board always has the power uh, to, to, to go any route it wants to go. The problem you run into if you start making exceptions uh, without some sort of process being built, built into the ordinance is one potentially of selective enforcement. Uh, you, you could run into, I guess, one of two things. Either uh, everyone could want to put out a sign uh, and, and you just say, okay, at, at that point uh, you don't have much of a, a sign ordinance in place, or somebody comes in uh, that you're not as gung-ho about uh, letting them put a sign out then you you've allowed somebody under this under the language of sign order to put one out and you haven't allowed somebody else to do it uh, Chris do you want to speak to some of those issues yeah and you hit most of them the signs that you'd be putting out are categorized as snipe signs right. and the ordinance just expressly prohibits mm -hmm. snipe signs mm -hmm. and doesn't give any wiggle room on allowing them and I looked in the ordinance for any kind of variance criteria because if the board had firm criteria mm -hmm. to make an exception, then it would be a fact-by-factor, factor-by-factor determination of whether the criteria is met. 
and the ordinance doesn't contain that either. And so in the absence of both of those things, mm -hmm. my recommendation would be uh, to not make an exception since we don't have the criteria to do it and the express language of the ordinance doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. Are they not allowed on private property or frontage or? It says that uh, snipe signs uh, are defined as signs that can be put on trees or poles or standalone signs uh -huh. in public right-of-ways, easements, alleys, or on private property. And then later in the ordinance, it says that <coughs> snipe signs are prohibited in all zoning districts. Okay. And so that's a pretty tough Okay, it can shot. go in a window? I mean, we would be thrilled if we were talking about 20 signs. I mean, we don't even have that many teams, you know. Um, Is, how, how does this differ from uh, election signs? Because I know that we, as, as people who campaign, could put signs on private properties. Yeah. There, there's an express exception. There's an express for political signs. For political signs, okay. Where, where, do, where, where, do, where, do you, where do the signs go? I mean, are they go to businesses or are they going on just right Yeah, away? we're going to put one in the window with the bookmark. So, so like, um, a MF Bank has one I mean, because they have a team. Barnhill. So whoever has a team. Right, right. Can put a and sign. as I said, we'd be thrilled to have 20 teams, you know, and they all get one sign. <laughs> and we're talking about eight weeks. Yeah. Anything on the window? And we. I anything mean, in a the, window? Anything on the window would fall outside of the defini definition mm -hmm. of a snipe sign. Okay. So that means it'd be okay. So you'd be okay with wind. So don't use the little wire rack that they come with. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. That's all we had. We just wanted to invite you to the relay and ask about our signs. Any further discussion? <laughs> further discussion? Further discussion? Alden Ball. May 7th, what time? We five start at 5. And we're going to try to go till 1. We're going to have events for your entire family. <coughs> Please bring all your kids to lawn chairs. We're going to have plenty of food. We're having an American Idol type contest. We're going to have a relay idol with preliminaries, <coughs> finals that night. We have a great band coming out, uh, musical malpractice. <coughs> so we, we've got a big night planned. Our theme is birthday parties. We're celebrating more birthdays, more candles, more lives. And it's yeah. going to be great. Be our best one yet. And it's moved this year, right? It's not at the it's last year's. Sports place. It, it is the sports place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be bigger and better. Any further questions or comments? I guess last one. I, I, well, I we'll really enjoyed it last year. <laughs> and, and yes, lo looking forward to being there again this Good. year. This, this is a fantastic event and a, and a credit is. to our community. Yeah. All is this the first time that you've done these signs with a participating? No, they've been out for years. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask this. If we put Mayor Wiseman up here, would it be considered a political sign? <laughs> we fudge a little? I don't think so. A long year for that. Does anybody have cancer? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> the Passage of Time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. Properties. We uh, provide services to adults with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, work training services, um, day treatment services. We're located out on 1411 Highway 389 um, since about 1998. We've been in business uh, in Starkville since 1992, providing this service in, in uh, different locations. Um, right now, we're looking to expand our business and um, We've got to resolve a, a problem with our, we're on septic right now, septic tank. And uh, right now we're under some regulatory pressure. I think there's a letter in your packet we received from the health department. They came out and found our system wanting, just to put it kindly. Um, so we've got about 30 days to come up. They, the letter says improve it, fix it. But uh, they told us that if we came up with a plan that was acceptable, 
that that would be fine and then, then move forward aggressively to take care of that. And actually, we're looking to expand our business uh, this year. And uh, I'd, I'd rather take our resources on that expansion and add to the tax base and bad jobs and that sort of thing rather than dealing with uh, uh, sewage. What, what I think we'd like to do and what would be best, I think, is uh, find a way to hook up to uh, city uh, sewage at our, at our location. We uh, provide services to 72 people. Uh, including employees, and uh, <coughs> that's just, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking y'all to spend some money. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and I, I guess I'll lead in on the uh, comment portion of, of this again. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, part of the 1998 uh, Annex Territory, and uh, what um, the Chief Administrative Officer is, is working on pretty much daily at this point. Uh, and I think she's concluding the assessment project, uh, a pro part of the project, and that is uh, she's been riding uh, counting houses uh, in, in all of the uh, 1998 territory so that we can begin to make an assessment as part of the 2011 budget process as to what is economically feasible uh, for us to meet in the 1998 uh, annexation. Uh, and hopefully we, we can get uh, some final resolution on 1998 because it's, it's long overdue uh, at this point. Uh, but what I guess I would recommend on this is we let the chief administrative officer finish that process so we can evaluate all of that area at, at once and determine uh, what we have the ability to fund in next year's budget. Questions or comments from the board? Alderman Davis. Doug, where's, how far is the... How close is septic? Our sewer. Uh, I, my, it's my understanding the closest now is uh, the fire station on 389, and that's like two lots up for, from us. So we're talking about 50 feet, 100 feet. No, no it's a little bit more than that. Those are pretty big lots. Those are big lots. Yeah. The price estimate I put in your packet was supposed to be grabbing. Yeah. You and your timeline on this is what? I have to submit some sort of plan to the health department um, within 30 days. And what they told me, if, if I could get some sort of an idea from the city um, on what y'all could do, then they would in turn give us a letter to make uh, a temporary repair to, repair to our aerator until such time as we get a city connection going. I mean, right now, the way the, they're enforcing the regulations, uh, I can't even get my aerator worked on or the, the person that works on it faces a stiff fine. I mean, they won't touch it at all uh, the way things are now. Uh, and to add fuel to the fire, uh, my DEQ uh, renewal is coming up uh, later this year, and that's, that's not going to fly. So this is 30 days from when? Uh, today, or is that? February 12th. February 12th, yeah. So we're looking 10 days from now. The clock, yeah, the clock's kind of ticking. I, I, Doug, I, didn't, I don't have a cost estimate anywhere in mind. Is that, do you remember what that, what that was? Um, it was uh, to run the gravity sewer with about 50 or 30,000. Going how far? Um, it's about 20. Businesses are you talking about? Or? Let's see, we got the vet clinic, um, Florida Care, <coughs> so, um, Olive Brothers, um, there's a uh, auto repair shop, and um, then there's another building that's vacant. So right now, I'd say there's probably <coughs> businesses. The issue and i know this doesn't help you much right now uh that, that you run into when you start taking an area is there are lots of areas uh, remaining in the 1998 area and 
again, my, my, my apologies that the situation is uh, a, as a whole where it is, but I think the only way uh, to realistically uh, uh, address it in, in, in some manner that makes sense holistically is to take all of that together and, and determine uh, where it's economically feasible to go. Mr. Mayor, let me say, maybe recognize. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. Daly. Evening. Uh, let me just personally recognize you, and you've uh, corresponded with uh, me on this matter in that it lies with an award. And I forward to your emails, as you know, on to our Chief Administrative Officer, Ms. Sproul, <coughs> while she's here on a daily basis. And, and there's such a big demand on um, trying to get these services in annex areas, and, um, and most of that annex areas from 1998 lies within Ward 6, but um, I've asked Ms. Brewer to do that because she's our uh, person here uh, that uh, coordinates these matters with the department heads and the mayor and the board, and and if I may, Mr. Mayor, I would like for Ms. Brewer just to kind of uh, give us some enlightenment uh, additionally, if she can, about what she, her research has revealed, because I've just passed this on to her just for her to uh, give some type of recommendation on this. Um, Ms. Brewer, if you could briefly tell us what you've uh, come up with. Uh, I actually have one more area that I'm going to be looking at. I started a spreadsheet to show houses, businesses, and uh, various and sundry uh, entities that are not being served with sewer at this point in time. This area was one I just got done looking at, so um, and, and it actually was coincidental with this gentleman's issue. Um, we looked at it in terms of running a line down there, and that was one of the cost figures that Doug had. Initially, the look, based on our current situation, is that he would have to pump that sewer up to the main, which is up by the fire station number three there on 389, and that was also a cost estimate that uh, Doug had run. He, get, he provided me that in an email, and I apologize, I did not get it into your packet because this gentleman just wanted to make a presentation and I was waiting until I had more thorough information to give you all a full picture of it. So um, I have, as I mentioned, there's one more area to the northeast of the city that I need to take a look at to determine how many houses and then at that point in time I'll at least have a number of residences and businesses that do not have sewer. And from that we were going to determine how we were going to approach it given the budget, the upcoming budget year. And that's what the mayor was referring to. But uh, as it relates to this particular situation obviously we'll do whatever the board um, desires but uh, his situation is is time critical from his perspective but either pumping it or taking a line to him is they're the, essentially the only options that we have. Further discussion? Alderman. Yes. Um, tell me a bit more about the, the possibility of providing a letter to the Department of Health and you being able to make temporary repairs? Yes, ma'am. It's our understanding that uh, if you all decide that you will bring uh, sewage down closer to us where we could uh, uh, attach to it um, and, and, and get some sort of a letter committing to that in a reasonable length of time, that the health department would in turn issue a letter that we could show to a vendor allowing us to have the aerator repaired and whatever and adding chlorine all the necessary repairs to have a, a working system and we could go forward and that gives us a little everybody the city and us a little breathing room we continue continue to operate without worrying about uh, department of environmental quality and the health department and you all have an opportunity to uh to get that done without just racing around do you think that allowing this to take place in our the cycle that Mayor Wiseman is describing um, as part of budgeting for next year will satisfy the Department of Health? I, I, I have no way of can knowing. You, I, can you predict the future? <laughs> oh, if only I could. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I don't know. Man. I don't know. D does it help you if you're able to write them in a letter uh, that, that the city will be making a determination on it uh, by September 15th, uh, 2010? Because um, we can give you that date. I, right. I, I, I can tell you uh, for certain uh, that, that, that you will have a much clearer picture on, on where this is going long term by September 15th of this year, which is when mm -hmm. the budgetary process rounds out. Um, I, again, I, I I can't be very responsive to what the Department of Health thinks about that, or, or I, I kind of sense just in talking to them that that date might be a little far out 
considering they've already said, give, give us 30 days, give us a plan in 30 days. Mm -hmm. And actually the letter says, fix it in 30 days. And if it would help, I, I, I can talk to them. I, I don't know if uh, you know, hearing from somebody getting assurance that that's mm -hmm. what's happening uh, helps, but uh, I, I'd be more than happy for my part yeah. to do something like that. And, and, and your people in Starkville have been very, very nice, very cooperative, but they in turn have folks in Jackson at their main office that they need to report to and, and, and make them happy as well. Uh, it may come down to that. Uh, if I could give you a call later on, I, I could certainly let you know on that, and we'll see how amenable they are to something like that. So, so I mean, and this may be more detail than we're, we need to get into, but so your choices are trying to get a letter that would allow you to repair it mm -hmm. or replace the whole septic tank. The septic tank, I mean, to get one uh, large enough to really meet the needs and in, in our expansion we want to do, uh, that's just uh, really cost prohibitive. I mean, we've looked at it, and the, 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 uh, probably the best thing to do is, is hook into the city. Um, and, and it looks like, I mean, if, if you guys don't, aren't able to do anything, we'd have to pump it all the way up to the uh, fire station. Um, so okay. that's kind of the options we're looking at. Any further questions or comments from the members of the board? Any further questions or comments? Any further questions or comments? Mr. Mayor, so what you suggesting is a closure to this one? What are your final thoughts on this? My my thought on it is it's premature uh, for for us to make uh, funding decisions on on meeting uh, the, the the sewage needs in the area, and uh, on, on a personal note. I will do on behalf of the city uh, whatever uh, would be helpful to convey the information of where we are in our process because while September 15th, uh, given where you are uh, with, with the, the mandate they place on you seems a long way off, uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's a, a pretty short duration uh, where, where determination will be reached on it. Uh, so that, that that's my recommendation in a nutshell. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Um, that concludes our public appearances. We'll now move into public hearings. And we have two public hearings scheduled this evening. Uh, the first is the second public hearing on the repealing and replacing of the animal control ordinance. And the second is the first public hearing on the repealing and the replacing of the stormwater uh, control ordinance. So we will keep with standard practice for public hearings in that uh, the person closest to the proposed ordinance uh, will be asked to introduce. We'll move into a public comment portion in which uh, persons wishing to speak uh, in, in favor and against uh, will be recognized for a maximum of three minutes apiece, uh, alternating with those uh, wishing to speak in favor and those wishing to speak uh, against, uh, speaking after one another. And the maximum amount of time uh, is 15 minutes uh, per side. The uh, first public hearing uh, before us is the second public hearing on the repeal and replacement of the animal control ordinance. Alderman Dumas. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in your packet, you have a ordinance that we talked about and discussed last week. Um, since that time, we have uh, met with concerned citizens. We've met with uh, those working with the uh, American Kennel Club. We've worked with uh, several other groups, and we've talked with animal control um, officers, etc. And we've made some additional revisions, and those revisions are not in your packet. They were placed on, your, uh, on the table in front of you. And what you have is two different um, two different sheets of paper. The one on the right, well, the one on my right, uh, the one that's underlined shows the changes, the modifications, one on the left, my left, which doesn't really help you, uh, with no underlining, is one that we'll discuss. Uh, is the same thing without the modifications. I want to speak to the one with double underline and, and some, uh, some of the language being stricken. On number 10, and this is just catching everybody up with, um, there's, there's really been one significant change. Um, on number 10, there were some questions as to uh, the redundancy of number 10 with number 12. 
And this is on page three. And what was decided was that instead of the redundancy, we would move any language from number 10 that spoke to tethering or zip lines or whatever the language is, we would move that to number 12 and retain the language in number 10 that speaks directly to uh, pinch type, prong type, and choke type collars. And so number 10 speaks directly to collars. Um, everything else is moved to number 12 as far as uh, the running line, the tether. On number 11, we have added the language of a domesticated animal because the question was raised in some of the meetings as, um, you know, how am I going to move my cattle or my horse in the barn when there's a heat advisory or when there's a cold weather spell or, you know, the, the types of legis you know, uh, legitimate questions that, that should be raised. So number 11 speaks only to a domesticated animal, dogs, cats, etc. cetera. Um, the previous ordinance uh, had as 11A, 32 degrees and as you remember it talked about 32 degrees uh, as being the the coldest in which an animal could be outside period regardless of structure regardless of anything uh, as the ordinance was written it was against the law to have an animal outside below 32 degrees um, we have put some language in here that speaks directly to cold or winter weather advisories by the National Weather Service taking out the 32 degree Fahrenheit language um, and we've put in there uh, the section that speaks to animal is not provided access to climate controlled area warming equipment or devices products methods capable of mitigating the extreme cold um, I've had several questions about this regarding so this means I have to have an, a climate controlled doghouse well no it does not uh, what we're concerned with here is that before the ordinance spoke directly to uh, the fact that your dog could not be outside under 32 degrees uh, this language allows the animal to be outside under 32 degrees or above, as you see in letter B, above a heat advisory with some type of significant, some type of structure that helps either mitigate the cold or mitigate the heat, whether that be a doghouse, some type of something that helps and shelters the dog and the animal. Um, so that speaks to 11A and B. Uh, 12, and this is where the largest change from last week is concerned. Uh, we have moved, as it was written last week, it spoke directly to tethering um, unrestricted or, or uh, some type of device that restricted the movement of the animal for more than three hours within a 24-hour period. What we have added is moving, again, the, the language from <coughs> Section 10 to number 12 so that it now reads, uh, a domesticated animal is held chain tethered or has its movements unrestricted unreasonably restricted for more than three hours within a 24-hour period provided however that a domesticated animal may be chain tethered or have its movements restricted for a reasonable period of time to allow the responsible owner or custodian to perform necessary tasks so long as the chain is 10 feet or longer or shorter than 10 feet but attached to a running line that provides adequate movement this just reorients the language from section 10 um, to allow that it's still, we still as the city do not, or this ordinance is written, um, of not allowing an animal to be chained to a fixed object for three hours or more than three hours within a 24 hour period. Um, but the question was raised, well, what happens if I go to work and the only thing I can do is tether the animal to a zip line or some type of something that has, uh, with a responsible owner, with reasonable <coughs> movement. And this additional language adds to that the fact that within a reasonable amount of time, that animal can be tethered with freedom of movement uh, for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so that clarifies, I know Alderman Parker had asked the question last, uh, last week or two weeks ago of what was a fixed surface, you know, what about a zip line, those types of things. And so this language should help um, clarify that so that when the need arises from the animal control officers, et cetera, to deal with that situation, they have the needed language. Um, those are the changes. Um, and lat well, I don't know if we talked about last week, uh, section one. Now this is not on the two pieces of paper that you have. We have added the, uh, and this came through communication with, uh, again, folks with the animal, the, um, the American Kennel Club, et cetera, of, under section one, number one, uh, at the end of the sentence, 
if enclosed in an adequately ventilated, or, or ventilated cage, pen, vehicle, trailer, or other enclosure suitable to prevent escape of said animal and of uh, sufficient size as not to be overcrowded or, or cramped. Uh, overcrowded spoke to a more plural standpoint, so multiple dogs in one. But there were instances that were brought to our attention in which uh, bigger dogs were put in kennels and cages that were far too small for the animal. And so uh, overcrowded did not speak to the needed, uh, you know, again, that was more of a plural aspect of too many dogs, but yet we needed some language in there that talked about um, in situations where cruelty existed from the standpoint of a larger animal being shoved into some type of device that was much too small for the animal. This helps speak to that language. Um, so those are the changes. Uh, at this time, I uh, yield the floor. <clears throat> Questions or comments from the board for Alderman Dale. Alderman Carp. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. I had a lot of questions about the heat lamps and if that was going to be some mm -hmm. type of electronic device needed to control or mitigate heat or, uh, or cold. <coughs> would a standard dog house with cedar chips, would that be sufficient for the, you know, I mean, just one you buy at Walmart? Like, I've got a, just a box dog house with no door. Is that sufficient for this ordinance? From my perspective, it is. And I'll use this example. Um, I like to duck hunt. I've got a dog that's starting in September. I start acclimating to the outdoors so that, you know, mid-January when I take him hunting, um, you know, a thousand miles north of here that he's not just completely. So, so yeah, I think there, and again, I think the subjectivity of this falls back to the animal control officer of being able to look at the situation and understanding what the responsibilities are and what the situation is. But, uh, and I think that speaks to the to whatever the method or device is of mitigating the cold. Of, uh, you know, obviously if it's negative 15, um, you know, I, I think all those conditions come into play, obviously, but uh, I think the main thing when you read the last ordinance of understanding that it was a drop dead of 32 degrees, period, uh, then it really gave some, the flexibility was not there to really work the ordinance the way that it needed to be. Further questions or comments for Alderman Dibbs? Any further questions or comments for Alderman Dibbs? Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move to the public comment portion of the public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance change? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Yes, sir. First of all, thank you. And Mayor and board. My name is Dennis Nordeen. I'm a dog owner. I have two dogs. And I can say this about having dogs, that dogs can be your friend or they can be the neighbor beast. Now, the best way to turn a nice dog into a mean dog is to tether the dog. Dogs are not meant to be tethered. They're free in nature. They should be free, period. So basically there are communities that have prohibited <coughs> chaining all together. <coughs> Fayetteville, Arkansas, for example, does this. Okaloosa, Florida does this. Durham County, North Carolina does it. And there's many, many others that do it. There are other communities that have limited chaining by time, which is what is being proposed here. But what is time? A dog doesn't have a clock. At least the dogs I have do not have dog clocks. So I think the problem still exists. A tethered dog turns into a dangerous dog because dogs are territorial. All you have to do is look at that dog that attacked in Terry, Mississippi and killed a five-year-old girl. That's what can happen to a dog. Do we want a dog like that in Starkville to kill one of our children or one of us? So I think we should really think seriously about tethering. It's not necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance, Jack? Greetings, my name is Adam Moore. So, about three years ago, a white lady was jogging along on the sidewalk. A uh, uh, pit that wasn't changed, almost bit scared us half to death, whatever we was on the pool. Now, we got a dangerous dog water. 
But if we try to please some, we make the enemy with others. Now we then we have the rock, the pit, the dog, the young shepherd, those dogs that they have a nature and they will turn. And and we have our uh, people from the electric department, people from the police department. If those dogs come at them, electric department don't get the lightning stick. They come at the police officer they won't get it. Well, we put them to sleep. So uh, we don't need to make more trouble for ourselves. We have a dangerous dog on it. We need to have safety for us all. Um, dog supposed to be a man's best friend, but we have seen what they have been the most in. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance? Mayor, board, mayor, mayor, members of the board, all of them. Uh, I'd like to address some of Mr. Uh, Turner's uh, issues. One, under the ordinance that's proposed, the revision, no dogs would be, would be running free. There's still a leash law in Starkville, and it would be illegal to let your dogs run free. So hopefully that addresses the safety problem that you have out there. Uh, as far as, let me just say that I, I'm in favor of the revision for several reasons. One is the public safety aspect because dogs that are tethered become more vicious and more prone to bite people. And that's proven. Animal behaviorists can tell you that. The second thing is that chaining a dog for its life is inhumane treatment. And then the third thing is that this ordinance would improve our community's image, not just regionally, not just nationally, but globally. This is something that if a company from Germany was looking to, to you know, put their business in Starkville, this would be something that, was, that would be good for Starkville. <coughs> Dogs play an important role in our lives. They act as search and rescue dogs when there is a natural disaster. They act as therapy dogs for people both young and old. They act as the eyes for blind people and help them navigate through the world. And they can even sniff out cancer. Dogs deserve a lot better than to be chained for their life. I'm in favor of this revision of the tethering ordinance and I hope that you guys will do this because it's right it's going to protect the people in our community it's going to be a humane way to treat animals and because it's good for the city thank you thank you Mr. Nordy is there anyone wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance anyone wishing to speak against anyone wishing to speak against is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Fred Stewart. I live in a nice neighborhood in Longmeadow, and I'm not for or against the tethering situation. My situation is, is that I feel that a dog has a life. He needs to go outside. He needs to see life outside. He doesn't need to be tested. He doesn't need to be chained up. But he needs to go outside. I think tethering is a probable cause for him to go outside. You lock him up in a confined area, which is 20 by 30, he's not going to get a very much life. He's going to sit in that dog house and he's going to sleep. It's just like you carry him in your home and he's going to sleep. He's not going to walk around. He's not going to get no exercise. He's going to have to walk him. So, this brings the factor of what is the best thing for the dog? Y'all are not thinking about the dog. 
you're thinking about the people. Other side of the situation is, well, people love dogs. We have cats running around everywhere, right? We aren't doing anything about that. We're not even enforcing the laws that we have on the books now. I mean, right now, just tell me what kind of laws we have on the books now, on dogs, that we're not enforcing. The $10, $10 law for each dog to be certified in the city of Starkville. You go down the University Drive, is anybody enforcing that law? You can sit a police, police out there on both sides of University Drive and they can ask if that's enforced. What do you go and enforce this law? You go sit somebody out there, a cop sitting there for three hours to see if that dog is tethered that long? That's an enforceable law. And you can go and carry to any law and Chief Lindley can tell me the same. You cannot enforce this law. But thing is, I believe in tethering a dog, but he should be able to go outside and yet it doesn't matter how long he comes to the My dog goes outside, he sits in his backyard for eight hours, I ask him to come in, he can go. Is that all right? It, you, you've got one minute. Oh, I got one minute? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've, what I'm trying to say is, people don't understand Dogs are just like humans. They want to be with their, their master. But if he doesn't want to be with his master, they can go outside and have a good time. There are people just like me and you. They're just animals. I mean, I have all kinds. My brother is part of the Cattlemen's Association. We don't treat animals. I've dealt with animals ever since I've grown up, all since my life. So anybody should know, if you're going to do something to animal and force him to be somewhere he's not supposed to be, that's not a necessary need. Do you agree? Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak against? Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed order? Seeing no one, that will close our public comment portion of the public hearing. Are there any comments by the members of the board? Alderman Carp. Got one more question for Alderman Dumas. This has no effect on dogs running around in a fenced in backyard, correct? That's right. Okay, thank you. Further comments by the members of the board? Any further comments? Any further comments? Any further comments? Seeing none, uh, next order of business is the first public hearing on the repealing and the replacing of the stormwater ordinance. Alderman Parker. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the committee who have uh, come to countless meetings and, and allowed us to hash through uh, the stormwater, uh, a new stormwater or stormwater control ordinance. What we thought we could maybe do in a pretty quick time frame, ended up taking longer than we anticipated, but uh, but there was a lot of information to, to go through, and uh, the, there's a copy, Every, everyone had a copy in our packet, and I just want to briefly go over some of the highlights of what we've what we've added, changed, revised, and, and with the understanding that there's still some some wording in here that may change from this week to next, just from a, and, and I'll get to that some of the wording that I think will change between now and next week, but this is the basic premise of our, of our ordinance uh, that we're going to be discussing. The, uh, at the very beginning of the ordinance, uh, we've actually just added some definitions. We, we've now defined what new development, redevelopment, just we, we've actually defined things that are going to be part of the ordinance. We've then added, uh, we've added some tables and we've added uh, runoff coefficients and curb numbers We've added those values to kind of make them standard. So everybody's using the same coefficient. Uh, and we've, we've kind of just explained to everybody, this is what we're going to use, and this is what we want to want you to do your fig figuring on. Um, the, trigger, the, the trigger for people that this would apply to is any new development or redevelopment that is two acres or greater. Uh, it would apply to that. 
or if your development is one to two acres and it has more than 50% impervious surface. So that, that was one of the big issues was the trigger that we were, that we were coming up with. Um, we, have, we have exemptions that are included, one of which being a single family lot, no matter what the size. So if, if you have a single family residential lot, provided you're not, provided you're not in a uh, established development, then, then it doesn't matter your lot size, you don't have to do any stormwater mitigation. There, there's some other uh, exemptions in here. Um, we basically changed the work, changed words themselves. You know, we, we changed from detention to, we kind of wanted to have one word that went throughout the document, which is, which is uh, stormwater management and mitigation. We've used those two words throughout the document. Um, we have, when, we're, when we are figuring our pre-development we changed some wording before it said that the standard we used was natural undeveloped land we changed that to pre-developed land so we were basically the numbers that you start with are what the land is now as it sits now not before it was ever developed so um, we've also changed the rain event before we were controlling a 25 year storm now we're going to be controlling the two and ten year storms and we're going to be controlling both those storms. Um, we've also got, and this is, uh, we've changed some wording that says if you are a design professional that is licensed by the state of Mississippi, then you're approved to do a stormwater mitigation plan. Um, we've also set up approved calculation methods so while there may be many different calculation methods in many different textbooks we've actually set up a standard um, a standard calculation method that everybody will use so everybody's starting with the same numbers and finishing with the same numbers uh, or the same you know the, the basically the coefficient that they start with we've added uh, some recommended design methods uh, our wording is uh, we've added the de design methods in the, in the Georgia Stormwater Manual, which is the Georgia Stormwater Manual is actually a manual that goes over many different techniques and methods used to have stormwater mitigation. So we've, we've included that as a, as a recommended document that we would, anything that came from that document would be approved by the city. But we've also left it open to say anything in the, you don't necessarily have to use the Georgia Stormwater, but or anything below here. Uh, in our own document you can use. Uh, for retention ponds greater than four, uh, for retention ponds greater than four feet, we require safety benches uh, for a safety measure and then we, we have changed the wording to allow no fences unless they're approved by the city engineer. The inspection and penalty phases or the inspection and penalty areas have changed and this is one area that we're probably going to make some more wording changes. Uh, we basically increased the fines that we had before. I think before it was a, a maybe a $500 fine. As far as the, the fine, we've increased that to $5,000, but we've actually taken out the criminal aspect and jail time. Um, we have given some procedures of if you're found in non-compliance, we, we've got some procedures in place that we, we really need to define a little more of the city notifying whoever is in non-compliance and giving them a certain time frame uh, to get their to get everything back in compliance. And we've also set up an appeal board uh, that would hear any appeal. If you, if you were looking, if, if a developer was looking for a waiver to the stormwater management uh, ordinance period, they would go to this appeal board and present their case in front of the appeal board. Uh, that, that appeal board would be made up of uh, three people, and, and Alderman Dumas and Sistrunk are, are on, the, on the committee, so they can add to this and, and change. Um, but that committee would, would hear appeals, and then they would then, in turn, be allowed to make uh, exemptions, you know, under under the guidelines that we give them. It's a lot of it's a lot of things, so it, it, it requires uh, everybody at the table here to really read through the. It was very hard to take the existing ordinance and just make 
strikeout changes. We basically had to, we used the, the framework of the existing ordinance and then we've added and deleted and changed. And uh, so it's, it's, it's almost an entire new document. So. Saying that, I, I'll, I'll give it to Alderman Dumas and Sistrunk to see if they have anything to add. Well, I, I just want to say I, um, I sat in on the meetings. Uh, I did very little in crafting this ordinance. So I want to give all the credit. I, I think a lot of credit is due to both Sandra and Eric uh, in, in how this was handled. Um, we had some very lively discussions, and, and I think, you know, tonight we're, we're looking at a certificate of occupancy. We're looking at a building permit for a project that was directly impacted by this very ordinance. And I think we see that across the, not this, not the proposed ordinance, obviously, but, but the issues stemming from ordinance, uh, this, this ordinance in the past. And I, th I think even coming in, we understood how of a contentious issue this was. And so I, I, I really am pleased with the process of how it worked out. Um, I think one key thing that should be noted, there, there is a lot of information out there. There are a lot of different styles and languages and other type things associated with stormwater mitigation and ordinances in the, in, across the country. Uh, and I think th the way this was handled and looking at the way that uh, if you look at EPA phase two and if you look at um, EPA phase one was a mandate from the EPA for community, uh, communities, I, I believe over 100,000 people were mandated to meet certain requirements. EPA phase two came in and was a requirement for communities of 50,000 and greater. Um, so we're on the threshold of, you, of, of understanding not only of an EPA phase three that could be applicable to us, but also uh, the mandates of EPA phase two, and we have no idea what the census will hold. We know we're growing. I don't know if we'll be over 50. I don't think we will. Um, but regardless, there are issues there that are mandated across the government or from the federal level that have been applied to this so that when those issues and those mandates come, we are prepared. And I think that's a great step in looking at how this ordinance should be placed and how that it does so that it not only puts us into compliance from the federal level with potential mandates coming down the pipe, but it also allows us and gives us the flexibility to do the things to help encourage the proper growth and development that we need for the community. Uh, so I, I, give, I give kudos to those two. They, they did a great job in this and it was a, it was a tough process, it was a tough document and the things that are added into this, not only, but there are several of the committee members here, and I'm, I'm sure Eric will point those out, but, uh, you know, looking at how this process was handled and the result, I'm, I'm very pleased with this. So, thank you. Um, Sister? Um, I, I, too, want to thank the other people who served on the committee. I've learned more about stormwater than I would have ever hoped to know about it. But um, to kind of summarize some of the things that Eric said or to, to maybe uh, give you a different spin on some of the things that Eric uh, talked about. Um, we we tried to address the trigger, which was a, a difficult thing in the in the previous <coughs> ordinance. We um, addressed the the storm event that's the trigger to uh, and changed it to the two and ten year events as opposed to the twenty five year event. That means we'll actually be handling more of the storm water, smaller events, but more of them. So we'll we'll be dealing with that more. The ordinance deals with the quantity of stormwater that, that flows off of an area, um, the, the difference between the pre-development water that flowed off and the post-development water that flowed off. And so we're trying to, to do as much with that as we can. And we included the Georgia Stormwater Manual to give people other options for how they handle the stormwater. Our ordinance as was written was really a, a retention ordinance <coughs> and, and we're trying to give them some other options. There's some creative ways, especially in maybe some smaller lots to handle that and we're, we were just trying to encourage people to, to look at some of those other methods. All right, uh, and I'll just make a, a brief comment or two and it's uh, on your process. Uh, I just want to say I observed from a distance as this was going on over the past, uh, I guess, about four months now. I think the way y'all have worked through this issue, uh, and I understand there, there's still some discussion left to be had, but getting to this point uh, should be the model uh, for, for how you deal with difficult issues. Uh, when y'all started out, I didn't know how y'all were going to get through this. Uh, you had a very wide range of philosophies that, that you put uh, on a committee. <coughs> and, uh, 
everybody uh, may not be uh, jumping up and down ecstatic about it, but, but my understanding is y'all have gotten to a point uh, or close where everybody can live with what you, you, you came out with. Uh, and if that's the case, I, I think this will be a, a wonderful product and the work that you've done uh, will, will serve the city very well. Could, could I also point out some of the uh, committee members who were, who were here tonight? I see Mr. Richardson, Mr. Clayton Richardson, and Mike Brent back there. Is Jeremy Tabor or Corey Gallo? They were also on the committee and, and all were really helpful in getting us to this point. Questions or comments from the members of the board? Alderman Carl. Uh, tell me more about the stormwater hearing board. I, I, I've been told and just want to let the public know these are going to be three members that aren't related to any development in Starville, or I mean, what are the requirements for the board members? We, we've not actually <laughs> established the board yet, but what we're hoping are to find some people who have expertise. And there are lots of people in the community to, who have expertise in this area. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the makeup of the board will be, but um, we would like it to be an independent board. Since it's a quasi-judicial board, we would like it to be independent um, and be able to, to hear, hear these um, requests for waivers. There's a very specific set of criteria that they have to bring to this board. So we anticipate it being <coughs> something that would only occur occasionally. Um, not meet once a month or anything like that. We also anticipate it being something that would be able to meet quickly so that problems can be resolved and not delay a, a project. And, and the makeup and the procedures of that board, as Sandra said, will, is what we're, what we're coming up with now. The procedures, the voting, the voting and the procedures, and who, who makes up that board. Uh, we, we did anticipate it being uh, no city, I mean, no city employees, uh, on the board, it would be actually independent people that didn't have an interest, a vested interest, one way or the other, in, in what was coming before them. So. Further questions or comments from the board? Any further questions or comments? Autumn Court. Um, it looks like a good ordinance on the surface. I know this is just the first public hearing, so this is in really mm -hmm. a draft stage. Right. So um, one of the things that you may want to look at over the next couple of weeks are some of the, the terms used, for example, in applicability. Um, section one, number three, where it talks about land development activities less than an anchor. Mm -hmm. It uses the term, uh, unless they're part of a, quote, larger common plan of development. And so the thing that pops in my head is what does that mean? You know, how do you define a common plan of development? Well, it, it, you know, questions kind of like that. Sure, uh, sure. And, we'll, and we'll, we can define those. That, that would be a, uh, a file plat uh, from, if that's what we're going for, right? I mean, it would be a, actually a file plat whether that's a uh, residential or commercial plat. Uh, the process that somebody has to go through to get uh, to get land ready to build on, I mean, it, if they were if they were part of, of a neighborhood or development, then, then there is a filed plat at the courthouse, so. Mayor, may I address this? Mm -hmm. When this draft was presented late last week, Eric and I have been trying to get together to talk about the language because I'm, I'm, I've got some questions and concerns about several of the sections and uh, he was on the road today in Jackson and we hadn't had a chance to meet but we're going to get together and, and tighten up and firm up a lot of this language so this, this for sure won't be the final draft. Sure. There's, there's some work to be done but yeah. a great job uh, from the committee getting us this far because it's hard drafting law and, and this was a really good start. And, and I think what we've done is, is the, the major issues with this ordinance are, as Sandra said, in, in a, it, are, are the trigger and the storm events, and, and those two are, are there. Uh, the, what we're going to be working on this week will be language. Uh, so. Further questions or comments by the members of the board? Another Autumn question. Court. Speaking of the trigger component to this, was there any discussion as to what any potential cumulative impact might be of, say, multiple properties of an acre or less? Although one, one or two might not be much, it was you know was there discussion of what the impact as a whole may be? Holistic look at that, and whether the runoff from multiple well, we, 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 we did speak to that, and in, in reality, it, in reality, there, there will be rarely be a case, an occasion where there's ten one acre lots in a row, uh, because that would require a plat to be filed at the courthouse, and then they would fall up underneath the ordinance of ten acres. Say, so. Uh, there's just not that, that many cases where you're going to have a lot of lots in a row that fall under the ordinance. Uh, but yes, we, there was uh, 
I promise you, there were there was a lot of discussion about about that. So. Further questions or comments by the members of the board? Are there any further questions or comments by the members of the board? <coughs> any further questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move into the public comment portion of the hearing. Uh, Mr. Stewart. I, I all right, hold on just a second. Uh, we'll, we'll handle this with the same process that we handled the other ones, and that is moving through, uh, recognizing a speaker for and a speaker against. And the first up is anyone wishing to speak in favor? Is there anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed order? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Seeing no one, is there anyone wishing to speak against? Mr. Stewart. Well, I, I'm in, in favor of this order, and the situation is that uh, when we make a development in this town, we create a watershed. I'm in a floodplain. I pay $500 extra, plus my own homeowner's insurance. We need to look at this as a viable situation that we can take care of this problem before it becomes a problem for somebody down the road from us that's building a new house. Only thing I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone wishing to speak against? Is there anyone wishing? Mr. Pritchard. Mayor, I'm Clyde Pritchard with Pritchard Engineering. And I wish not to speak against necessarily, but just a comment, if you will. And I, I too would like to thank the Stormwater Committee. I've been in conversation with some of the members. I know it's a, a difficult issue with a, with a lot of technical jargon behind it. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ben Griffith who emailed me this copy of this ordinance today for review. Uh, particularly, I uh, commend you on intent and applicability of the ordinance. As I read it from an engineering perspective, I'd like for you to consider a few things. We, we see or I see a lot of language that says shall be computed by, shall be designed in accordance with, shall be in accordance with. And as I read that, there are references in this small document to the National Flood Insurance Program, MDOT frequency duration curves, USDA, NRCS TR55, Soil and Water Conservation District, standard engineering practice required or approved by FEMA, the U.S. Weather Bureau, the MDOT Roadway Design Manual, and the Georgia Stormwater Management Manual. I'm not sure that I can comply with all the shells and computes with and that they'll all agree. And, and there are quite a few references to that. There's also some uh, criteria stipulated in there for bypassing 50-year storm events and also some criteria in the retention pools for spillways of capacity that will pass a 100-year storm event. Again, some of this, from a physical standpoint, may be impossible. So again, I commend you. I, I think what I would ask from our standpoint would be less guidance on how to fulfill the intent of the ordinance and more freedom from an engineering standpoint on how to accomplish that. We're, you know, we're in a community that holds one of the premier engineering schools in the nation. Uh, we've got quite a few engineers per capita in this area, a lot of talented people, and I, I would like the ability to expertise or exercise their expertise and allow them to be innovative on how they accomplish these things. Uh, finally, uh, as Alderman Parker mentioned, there was language changed here that uh, essentially struck the requirement for a registered engineer to perform these services and open that up into a licensed design professional. Uh, I would have you know that uh, an engineer, paragraph one of our licensing law requires us or obligates us to the safeguarding of life, health, property, and promoting the public welfare. Uh, that's our charge. And to open it up simply to a licensed design professional could, in fact, uh, maybe have some people doing this work that you might not be qualified to do. So with that, I'll, I'll answer any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bridget. Is there anyone <coughs> wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? 
of the proposed order. This way. Uh, my name is Devin Turner again. Um, I don't know exactly what some of it is, but of what are the safety things if we have a water break and some water get into our water system? What are things that we as citizens must do to protect ourselves? Uh, this is different between uh, drinking water and stone water. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Is there anyone wishing to speak against the proposed ordinance? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance? Seeing no one, that will close the public comment portion of the public hearing. Are there any comments and conclusion by the members of the board? <coughs> any comments by the members of the board? Well, we, uh, what our plan is as the committee is to take, take things we've got tonight and our committee will meet again and make those revisions and I'll get uh, with our city attorney and make, those, make sure we have the wording correct. Our committee will meet to make sure that we address any concerns that were brought up tonight and by our next public hearing will have uh, should have should have had our, our final draft document any further comments any further comments any further comments seeing none that will conclude uh, the public hearing and that concludes the public hearing for tonight my suggestion before we start moving through business is we take a brief recess is there any objection to taking a brief recess any objection any objection seeing none stand in recess the passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. The meeting will now come back to order. Uh, next matter on the agenda is the discussion of uh, meeting options uh, for the school board appointment process. Uh, now I had, uh, I guess, more options potentially for you at, at one point than it appears that I've got now. Uh, uh, our, our options are mainly contingent upon when the Attorney General's opinion is, is going to come back. Now, the Attorney General's office has told us that the opinion will in all likelihood be rendered on Friday. Uh, I just had a conversation with the City Attorney, and he tells me that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be in hand on Friday. In, in fact, uh, it, it could be as late as Monday or Tuesday before we receive the opinion. Further complication that he notified me of is next Tuesday, He's got to be at the PNC meeting. I was going to suggest that uh, it would make most sense to either have a, a special call next Tuesday or delay this to the March 16th meeting. Unless you all want to pick another day, potentially next week, it looks like it makes most sense uh, ju just to take this up March 16th when we're sure we'll have the Attorney General's opinion and there's no conflict with the City Attorney. And, and how, does the, uh, how does that affect the, how does that affect Dr. Taylor. The, Dr. Taylor now. He, he cannot serve past today. Right? They'll just be, they'll have they'll four have members four on the school board. And I don't know what that means in case of a tie. Their, their attorney will have to work that out. Okay. Alden Carver. I'm going to be out of town Monday through Wednesday, so I'd appreciate it if at least be Thursday of next week or next the following Tuesday. Alden Paul. I just suggest we just move it over to the 16th. And we don't have to put anything on the record on this. If, if y'all are in consensus, uh, we, we'll just proceed with the agenda and, and go forward on the 16th. I agree with that. So you're saying we, we will have someone appointed on the 16th? No, this is no well, y'all would you move forward the with the process. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the AG's opinion. It, 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 it's all triggered by a decision made by y'all. So uh, the, way, the motion y'all put on the books last time, was wait until the Attorney General's opinion comes uh, and then uh, bring the applicants back in after the opinion's been received. Okay. 
any further discussion on that. The, the assumption that I'm operating under is that we're set to go to push this to March 16th. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, now uh, we'll move to board business. And the first matter on the board business agenda is consideration of amending the animal control ordinance. Alderman Dumas? Well, I appreciate all the uh, uh, the comments. Just to, uh, and I don't think Mr. Stewart is here. Is Mr. Stewart here? Yeah. Hey, Lee. Um, I just wanted to speak to some of his enforcement issues. We, uh, you know, this is obviously enforced by our animal control officer, not, not a police officer. They're... Um, so, so I think the enforcement issues are, are there, and um, are, are the enforcement ability is, is obviously there. So, so with that, um, I make the motion that we amend the Animal Control Ordinance 2008-07 and the City of Starville Code of Ordinances Chapter 18, Animals, Article 2, Regulating the Control of Animals, Division 1, generally Section 18 through 26. Alderman Dumas. Yeah, say what? Let me resend that motion. All right. Alderman Dumas is going to resend and restate. Um, I move approval of repealing and replacing the Animal Control Ordinance 2008-07 uh, in the City of Starville Code of Ordinances, Chapter 18, Animals, Article 2, Section 18-26 and 18-27. Alderman Dumas has made a motion to approve the repealing and replacing of the Animal Control Ordinance 2008-7 in the City of Starkville Code of Ordinances, Chapter 18, Animals, Article 2, Sections 18 through 26 and 18 through 27. Alderman Dumas, that's your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Carver. Alderman Dumas, you wish to speak on the merits? I do not. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Next order of business is the consideration of making appointments to the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Alderman Dumas. Uh, this was something that I brought to the table uh, last board meeting. I wanted to give you more opportunity to look at this list, um, ask questions, see who those are on there. And I, I've talked to a couple of you about some of the ones that are on here. Um, so uh, at this time, I guess before I make the motion, well, no, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, then we'll uh, we'll have discussion from there. So I move approval, and I, I would like to do this in a blanket uh, mm, approval. I, and and I'm not sure the what what term should I use there. Uh, I move approval of appointing the attached list to the committee of reviewing and making recommendations to amend the comprehensive plan. Alderman Dumas has made a motion to approve the appointing of the attached list to the committee for reviewing and making recommendations of the comprehensive plan and to amend the comprehensive plan. Alderman Dumas, that's your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Alderman Corey. Alderman Dumas, you wish to speak on the merits? I do not. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Magic clearly passes. Uh, next matter on the agenda is the consideration of the request by the Starkville Area Arts Council for street closures and in-kind services in the amount of $6,544 for the Cotton District Arts Festival scheduled on Saturday, April 17, 2010. Discussion? Alderman Court. Uh, Mayor and Board, I would move that we approve this request by the Starkville Area Arts Council to close the streets and provide in-kind city services for the Cotton District Arts Festival scheduled on Saturday, April 17, 2010, in the amount of approximately $6,544, as outlined in the special event application package, as reviewed and recommended to the City's Special Events Committee on February 4th. Alderman McCory has made a motion to approve the request by the Starkville Area Art Council to close streets and provide in-kind services for the Cotton District Arts Festival scheduled on Saturday, April 17, 2010, in the amount of approximately $6,544, <clears throat> as outlined in their special event application package as reviewed and recommended by the City Special Events Committee on February 4, 2010. Alderman McCoury, is that your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Dumas. Alderman Corey, do you wish to speak on merits? No. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please <coughs> signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Magic will pass it. Next matter on the agenda is the consideration of calling for a public hearing on the creation of an ordinance to require safety helmets for operators of bicycles and alternative vehicles under the age of 16. Discussion? 
I'll involve. Mr. Mayor, I move the approval of calling for the public hearing for the purpose of adopting an ordinance for the required children to protect the safety of health. Alderman Bond has made a motion to approve the calling of a public hearing for the purpose of adopting an ordinance to require child protective safety helmets. Alderman Vaughn, is that your motion? That's my motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Corey. Alderman Vaughn, do you wish to speak on the merit? No, sir. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Next matter on the agenda is the consideration of issuing an Extension on the certificate of occupancy for two businesses located at 972 and 974 Mississippi Highway 12 East to provide additional time to construct a stormwater retention facility and receive a final plat approval. Discussion. Mr. Mayor, I'd, um, I, I'm uh, this is obviously my ward, Dr. Starr is here. Um, I, I want to commend. Um, I guess the patience of all those involved with this this process of, of working through this of making it a process that now I see as a win-win for everybody involved so um, I've added a different you know obviously I added the, the different agenda item but um, I move approval at this time that uh, that we grant the tip uh, the temporary certificate of occupancy for 60 days to provide time to construct stormwater facilities and review and record uh, the Highway 12 Extension Property Phase 1 Final Plat. Alderman Dumas has made a motion to extend temporary certificates of occupancy for approximately 60 days to provide time to construct stormwater facilities and review <coughs> and recording of the Highway 12 Extension Property Phase 1 Final Plat. Alderman Dumas, is that your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Alderman Parker. Alderman Dumas, do you wish to speak on the merits? I do not. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Next matter on the agenda is the consideration of the revising of the position of receptionist clerk to that of general office clerk with telephone switchboard as the primary duty. Discussion? Ms. Outlaw. Uh, Mayor, this uh, item was um, put on to we have a receptionist position in the city clerk side. Well, it's in the uh, building. And we're trying to uh, incorporate that into a general office clerk because the duties of the receptionist is, has changed and it's no longer a receptionist position. And we're just asking for that change. Discussion by the board. Alderman Carp. Ms. Outlaw, will this, how will this conflict with the uh, the senior citizens that we're using, would this person be responsible for answering the phone that's out in the main lobby or was in your office? In, in, in our office. Okay. The, the senior citizens are out in the lobby right. directing track. Okay. Alden Park. Does the revision affect the pay grade? No. Further discussion? Any further discussion? <clears throat> Alderman Court. Um, see, I'm trying to get the best way to word this, yep. but um, I would move that we approve the revision of the position of the receptionist clerk in the office of the city clerk to that of general office clerk uh, at the same paying grade as uh, as before with uh, telephone switchboard listed as primary duty. Alderman Corey has made a motion to revise the position of receptionist clerk in the office of the city clerk to that of general clerk with the same pay grade as existed previously with the telephone switchboard as a primary duty. Alderman Corey, is that your motion? Yes. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Perkins. Alderman Corey, you wish to speak on the mayor? No. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Outlaw. <clears throat> Next matter on the agenda is the consideration of issuing a building permit on property located at 976 Mississippi Highway 12 East. Alderman Dumas? Um, this is the second part of the property that I uh, talked about with Dr. Starr. We have an opportunity here that, um, well, just to kind of give some history of this, 
uh, they've been working through the process of this development of um, going through final plat submissions, the construction of stormwater mitigation facilities, and those processes are in place as we speak. Um, the part that's time sensitive here is the fact that Dr. Starr has been able to help um, recruit uh, Dr. Andrew Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin is a oral surgeon, a dual degree oral surgeon, MD, and uh, Dr. Starr is building him a facility adjacent to his facility that will, uh, that will serve in, in, in his, uh, and I guess it's a dual appointment between the hospital and, and his local clinic. Um, obviously this is something that's not necessarily and typically seen in towns of our size. I think there's some good things there, obviously. Um, the ordinance is written in front of you. It's in my hand scratch, so you'll have to, uh, you'll have to forgive me on my, on my language here. But one of the things that's interesting is that uh, Dr. Starr and his, um, and his engineers are working through the process on this temporary CEO, and so we're putting some dates in here that you'll see that we reference. So this is your typical building permit approval. Uh, April 20 is our board meeting, the second board meeting in April, in which um, the final plat should be and will be approved. Uh, there's some contingencies there that must be met, uh, both with um, um, stormwater, the stormwater facility being constructed and the, uh, the plat being approved. And so this ordinance, as you read it, and before I, before I read it, talks about a temporary building permit being issued up until April 20th. And then at the time in which the final plat is approved on April 20th, a permanent building permit will go forward. Uh, but the most important thing is, is that Dr. Martin um, needs to start training staff on June 1. So the building permit, and obviously it's time sensitive, so the construction can happen. Um, so the, the, or the, the motion is reduced to writing in front of you. Uh, read along with me. Move to approve a temporary building permit for 976 Mississippi Highway 12 East that shall expire April 20th, 2010. Upon approval of final plat, the final permit will be reissued for the continuation of construction. To the extent the phase one final plat is not approved by April 20th, 2010, a stop work order shall be issued and all construction shall cease. Alderman Dumas has made a motion, which I will not reread as it has been reduced to writing and you have it before you. Alderman Dumas, do you wish to speak on the merits of your motion? I do oh, not. excuse me. Uh, do we have a second? Second. The motion has been seconded by Alderman Parker. Alderman Dumas, do you wish to speak on the merits? I do not. <coughs> uh, any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. And the next matter on the agenda is the request for the approval of the City of Starkville Fire Department claims docket as of February 25th, 2010. Mayor, I'm asked to recuse myself. And we'll give Alderman Carver a moment to exit the room. So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion has been made to approve the City of Starkville Fire Department claims docket as of February 25th, 2010 uh, by Alderman Dumas. Motion has been seconded by Alderman Coria. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. And we'll give Alderman Carver a moment to rejoin it. Uh, next matter on the agenda, uh, we have three matters from uh, the personnel office. First is a request to approve the promotion of Christopher Brooks to the position of accounts receivable clerk. Mr. Boyd. Good evening, Mayor and Board. Um, we bring to you tonight uh, a request to fill the position of accounts receivable clerk. This job was advertised, um, approved for advertising by the Board on January 19th. We did advertise uh, for the position. We had a total of 37 applicants for the position. Two regular internal employees, one temporary uh, employee. Uh, and of those 37 candidates, we're bringing to you the recommendation for Christopher Brooks as the candidate to be awarded this position. It is the opinion of those of us that interviewed for the position that he is the best qualified candidate for the position. Discussion. 
Mr. Boyd does uh, Christopher Book meet all the minimum requirements as far as associate degree and then the equivalent training in business? Yes. Okay. Yes. Further discussion? Any preferred qualification? Um, he does have a, a bachelor's degree. Okay. And it is a budgeted position, right? Yes, it is a budgeted position. Further discussion? Yes, ma'am. Alderman Paul. I move the organization to promote Crystal Brook to fill the vacant position of account receiver clerk in the city of Star Office. Charges Christian attacked. Salary would be $24,553.19. That's equal equivalent to $11.80 per hour. Grade 8. Step 20, 2080 hours. Subject to a six month probation period. So Alderman Vaughn has made a motion to promote Christopher Brooks to fill the vacant position of account receivable clerk in the city clerk's office. Job description, excuse me, uh, salary will be $24,553.19, $11.80 an hour, grade eight, step, uh, should be step one. One, 2,080 hours subject to a six month probationary period. Alderman Vaughn, is that your motion? My motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion been seconded by Alderman Perkins. Alderman Vaughn, you wish to speak on the merits? No, sir. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Next matter on the <clears throat> agenda is the request for permission to advertise to fill the position of general office clerk in the city clerk's office. Mr. Boyd? Yes, this is the position. Christopher Brooks was in the position of receptionist clerk. You just approved a, a motion to change the, the content of that job to that of general office clerk with primary duty still including the, uh, the switchboard uh, position. Uh, and with his vacating that, we're requesting to advertise for the position of general office clerk. Discussion. This is a budgeted position. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any discussion? So moved. Motion has been made by Alderman Dumas to approve the advertising to fill the position of general office clerk as a replacement for receptionist clerk position being vacated by the promotion of Christopher Brooks with a salary for the position remaining as indicated in the amount uh, section above on the attached uh, handout. This is uh, Alderman Dumas, is that your motion? It is. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Alderman Vaughn. Alderman Dumas, do we speak on the merits? Do not. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Mm -hmm. Next matter on the agenda is the request for permission to advertise to fill the position of police officer. Mr. Boyd? Yes, uh, this is a request to advertise. Uh, we, we're budgeted for 51 uh, officers in a, plus two additional positions that are funded through uh, DUI grants. Uh, at this time, we have 53 people, but we have three that are uh, absent on military leave. One of those has told us that he will be prolonged considerably uh, and, and may very well not return at all. We're requesting to uh, advertise to fill a job that will be uh, temporary, full time, but with benefits. Uh, to cover this position that is vacant at this time. Mr. Mayor. Discussion. Alderman Perkins. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boyd, what uh, papers uh, do we advertise in for, the, for this position? Uh, Starkville, Columbus. Uh, Starkville and Columbus? Yes, sir. Okay. Do, do we normally get, get a good pool of applicants when we, when we apply? We, we have had a, a, a very good pool. Uh, the last time we advertised, um, and I'm sorry I didn't bring the exact numbers, but it, uh, it seemed to me that we had some 36 or so uh, candidates that applied. Uh, we go through a screening process to make sure that they meet the criteria. They're, those that do are invited to participate in the testing. And uh, how, by what's the, the time period of the advertisement? Uh, if, if this is approved tonight. Yes, sir. The advertisement would start in this Sunday's paper. Uh, it would be advertised two different times, and 
we would take applications for seven working days. So we would take applications starting uh, Monday and it would go through uh, Tuesday of the following week. I don't have those exact dates. And where does the advertisement appear? Does it appear in the, the legal or in the body of the paper? I mean, in the classified to... section. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Sir. Okay. Sir. Um, this officer will have his job when he comes home. If he returns, he would have his job back, yes. Okay. Okay. yes. Right. If we were over the budgeted numbers, then we would have to look at some reduction at that point in time with this being the last person <coughs> in. So if we had to have a reduction, this last person in would be the first person out. Because I understand the need. I just want to make sure that this all, you know, this, yes, we, you know, this individual we, coming home from serving our country has not, his job. Well, this would not in any way impact really his uh, return status. Because okay. you're bound by the USERA law. Absolutely. Right? Right. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in full compliance with USERA by yes. this approach. Yes. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Vaughn. I move to advertise to fill the position of the police officer. The position is vacant due to the military release of Officer Mark that Battertis. Officer Battertis has advised that the military leave will <coughs> last at least through the mid-August and possibly longer. This position will be full-time with the benefits of this salary will be as stated in the amount section. Alderman Vaughn has made a motion to authorize the advertisement to fill the position of police officer. This position is vacated due to the military leave of Officer Mark Batiste. Officer Batiste has advised that his military leave will last at least through mid-August and possibly longer. This position will be filled, oh, this position will be full-time with benefits and salary will be as stated in the amount section on this handout. Alderman Vaughn, is that your motion? That's a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been seconded by Alderman Perkins. Alderman Vaughn, do you wish to speak on the mayor? Motion. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Measure clearly passes. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. And that concludes the non executive session portion of our agenda. Uh, Mayor, I'm moving we move into closed session to. Determine, uh, determine, we need to go into executive session. Alderman Parker has made a motion to oh, move into closed session. session to determine whether there is a need for an executive session. Alderman Parker, is that your motion? Yes, sir. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Motion has been seconded by Alderman <coughs> Dumas. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, uh, all those opposed, please signify by saying nay. We'll now move into closed session and we will give everybody a moment to clear the room.